Good morning, you guys. It's your boy, Bill Mahari here, representing Mahari Nation Sports Podcast. Much love to the entire LDBC and the basketball community. If you want more content, if you guys want to talk about anything relating to the world of basketball, tune into the Basketball Conversations every Friday night, 9 p.m. Central Time. It's where we discuss basketball-related topics, news, debates, and everything else in the world of basketball. For all the new people that's coming into the channel, make sure to hit the subscribe button, hit the bell icon to get all the latest notifications when I drop some videos and live streams. And please spread the word about the channel as well. All right. So this is going to be another historical perspective video that I'm going to post up you guys every morning at 8 a.m. Central Time. So make sure to keep your notifications up when I start dropping it down. So this one's going to be a little bit different because um, it's not going to be talking about a player, but it's going to be talking about an executive director, uh, basically a person that created the term student athlete. Who am I talking about, you ask? Well, allow me to introduce Mr. Walter Byers, okay? Walter Byers was basically the first ever executive director of the NCAA, in which he basically began to serve back in 1941, okay? He was the, he was the guy that helped start the United States Basketball Writers Association in 1956, and the Walter Byers Scholarship named in his honor. During his leadership, during his time between 1951 towards 1988, he helped expand it in the NCAA men's basketball tournament from 8 to 16 teams back in 1951. He was the very first step in expanding the tournament to this big spectacle that you see today in March Madness, all right? Over the next few decades, teams fluctuated, but it never went below 16 and eventually, eventually, eventually expanded to basically the 64-team format and then basically the 68 that we see today in today's March Madness of basketball, okay? Now, in his leadership, okay, throughout his four decades of leadership, he took control of an organization that was being nothing more than a quote-unquote debating society for amateurism, you know, during Dirty Roosevelt's presidency, and basically founded the, the term student athlete, okay? So basically, the term of the the term of student athlete basically basically refers to is is that is basically a term that is ordered to insulate colleges from having to provide long term disability payments to players injured while playing in their sport, basically making money making money for their universities and the NCAA while the athlete doesn't get a damn penny. All right, and this man. Pretty much built a huge, huge nationwide modern money laundering scheme that is the NCAA currently today. Okay, as the time as the NCAA business grew over time, he particularly was he's spectacularly successful. He's negotiated long string look at TV deals and turned match March matter into an economic and social sensation. But he didn't. He was the kind of person that didn't enjoy the spotlight. He didn't even go to NCAA basketball tournaments. You know what I mean? He was the type of guy that didn't want to be brought in the spotlight for, for whatever reason. But eventually, the monster that he created over time basically became too much for him. And when he recognized that the whole pounding scheme of the NCAA was what pounding scheme of the NCAA was basically taking advantage of these athletes, he wanted them to try another way. He was suggested to try a different way to try to help, to try to try to make sure that these athletes are taken care of. But in 1984, various schools sued the NCAA for the rights to control their own TV deals. The cases went to went to the Supreme Court, and the NCAA lost in a very big way. And this would lead to the explosion of huge television money, and would have, and it would have made the schools and co and basically college conferences rich. But as of, at the time. This was seen as a real setback for the NCAA. You know what I mean? And he really, he really was the kind of person that created the term student athlete and created the foundation of the NCAA to what you see today. But he recognized how big a mistake that was. And he turned against the current form of the NCAA. In his, in his book called Unsportsmanlike Conduct, Exploiting College Athletes, Back, right, back in 1996, the book concludes that, that demands that Congress to free the athletes and enact a comprehensive college athletes bill of rights. He said, this is not a suggestion for new government controls. On the contrary, it is an argument that 
the federal government should require deregulation of a monopoly business operated by nonprofit institutions contracting together to achieve a maximum financial returns. In doing so, would retreat the, the twin curses of exploitation and hypocrisy that have bedeviled college athletics in, d- in direct proportion to its intensified commercialization and would prevent colleges from denying the players of freedoms freedoms available to other students. And finally, that he said also in the book, college, collegiate amateurism is not a moral issue. It is not a cam- an economic camouflage for monopoly practice, one, one which operates an airtight racket of supplying cheap athletic labor. So, when he eventually retired, he pretty much basically said, listen, we need to, just, we need to really heavily consider changing the entire format. But, unfortunately, the NCAA never listened, and as you guys pretty much know what's been going on, a lot of, a lot of schools have been paying a lot of these athletes you know, without the NCAA knowing because they understand the hypocrisy and the double standards that the NCAA likes to do with these athletes. In fact, I can tell you a little bit of a story. When I was in college, I met a uh, point guard for the for the University of Minnesota Golden Gophers, okay? And I would ask him, like, bro, does it bother you that you're not making a damn cent off of your likeness, of, off the ability to off of the ability to you know make money off of your abilities or, or off of your name? And he said it bothers him heavily. Because he's not getting anything. You think about that for a moment. A lot of these big time colleges and campuses, you know what I mean? Let's say the Alabamas, the Dukes, the North Carolinas, you know what I mean? The UCLA's, the Michigan States, all them big time programs. Think about this. They make money off the off of your talents and you don't get a cent. You see how difficult you see how ridiculous that sounds? All right. But Walter Byers created that term student athlete. To make sure that all these colleges didn't have to pay, you know, labor costs, didn't have to provide disability funds or even injury compensation for the athletes. And he recognized as the decades went on that it was a big, massive mistake. You know what I mean? And so when basically he began his retirement, when he was going to ja- interview a former sports reporter for the Sports Illustrated, Jack, Jack McCollum, okay, he was kind of preparing him for a huge interview. But when he when he pretty much pretty much says all the stuff about you know that he says you know I've reached to the point where I've started to think about an open division to to make it more for want for want of a better world professional. It was a shock because this was a man that basically defended the role of amateurism for more than thirty years, and he recognized that. The way that he that he basically built the NCAA was pretty much going to be the one that's going to collapse him right in front of his face, and it shocked him and it shocked a lot of people. So when he retired back in 1988, he kind of retired just quietly. He retired in his cattle ranch outside of Kansas City, Missouri, and pretty much doubled down on the on the role of amateurs. All right, even though his book in 1995 called on sportsmanlike conduct, exploring college athletes wasn't that successful. There are a lot of things in the book that it really relates to what's going on right now after the quotes I just read to you. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, Byers was not a person that was a was a was a kind of public person. He didn't go out do book tours or promote the book because it would have been really really interesting how the book would have gone far if they would have gotten the representation or the publicity that it really really deserves. All right. But when he spoke at a uh, Kansas City Sports Commission annual gala dinner, was the group was representing buyers with this award for exceptional contributions to amateur sports. But instead of, you know, being grateful for the award, he took the opportunity to attack the role of amateurism in college sports. So this is what he had to say, end quote, when he was only when he was only in his when he was in the 70s. He said Each generation of young persons come along, and that's all they ask. Coach, give me a chance. I can do it. And it's a disservice to these young people that the management of intercollegiate athletics stays in a place committed to an outmodeled code of amateurism. And and I am a and I attribute that too, quite frankly, to the neo plantation mentality that exists 
on campuses of our country and in the conference offices and in the NCAA. The coach owns the athlete's feet. The cause owns the athlete's body and the athlete's mind. And, it's, and the athlete's mind is supposed to comprehend a rule book that I challenged Dave Burst at the time, who's sitting down in this audience, to explain the rational terms, terms to you inside of eight hours. Very, man, I'll tell you what. For a man that pretty much understood the error, the, the, the big mistake that he made, despite defending the old guard of the NCAA, I give him some credit for recognizing that the whole thing was a Ponzi scheme and the NCAA is basically a bunch of hypocrites. Everybody know this. You know what I mean? And so he died back back in uh, 20 in 2015 and he died at the age of 93. But let's but I wanted to bring up this video to, 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 about his legacy to bring up a very important issue about how a lot of these athletes are being taken advantage of because they are pretty much, I'm just going to say it, and I don't really care what anyone else thinks. They pretty much are slaves to these college campuses and to these college sports programs because the athletes are the ones that are generating the money, and they don't get a cent. You think about that. Think about it, putting in so many hours every day. You go, you wake up. You go to practice. Then you get to school, get to your class. Then you got to go to your training program all day long. It's like a 12-hour job. And you get no money for it. And the only compensation is what? A full athletic scholarship. And you can't even work to make any decent amount of money because it's Durham making illegal benefits. See, I have been one of the big proponents of paying these damn athletes. And I'm glad that last year, um, I should say, was it last year California passed the law? I think it was last year that California you know, pass the bill to finally let the college athletes use their likeness to basically make to make themselves money. And the NCAA tried to, you know, influence them to not pass the bill, but it was too little too late. Slowly but methodically, a lot of these states are recognizing how ridiculous the NCAA has been all this time. And it's only a matter of time before most of all 50 states agreed that the NCAA, you need to start paying these athletes or just abolish the entire system altogether. And it's coming to a head now. So the question for them is this. How long, how long will this finally take before you recognize that these athletes are basically people, not cattle? So I wanted to make this video very, very important more informative to you guys because I felt like his 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 contributions to the NCAA was was relatively good with big time consequences to it because he recognized after retirement that the role of amateurism and the role on the term of student athlete became a kryptonite that is affecting the NCAA even today and a lot of these kids are the victims of all this because of a huge Ponzi Ponzi scheme of, of the, a lot of these colleges and universities, all right? They're making money off of the athletes' back, and they're not making a cent, all right? And that's what Walter Byers was standing up for in the final years of his life. And so I just wanted to put some shed on some light about who this man is because I know most of you guys don't know him at all. So I wanted to give you guys a little history lesson on that. But, but tell me what you guys think in the comments section. And y'all have a great day, guys.